So good afternoon, my name is Mel Gorman, I'm the SUSE Performance Team Lead. We're a development team that is responsible for responding to performance regressions, identifying regressions and repairing them. Is our primary purpose for SLE. The secondary purpose, of course, is to improve uh, mainline uh, with the, uh, as the product gets based on it in the future. And parts of that might be improving aspects of the core kernel. It might be like working on user space, although that's rare. It may uh, also involve a certain amount of hardware enablement, depending on whether it's related to performance directly or it's related to performance analytics, such as like PMU support. But the primary uh, problem that performance really deals with, it's not a black and white issue. If you're functionally testing something, it either works or it does not work. Performance, on the other hand, tends to be much more fuzzy because it, subsequent runs might have different results or there might be machine-specific behavior. And as a result of this, it means that the testing needed to ensure a performance is kept has to be extremely varied and run on a lot of hardware. And this is extremely time consuming. And so I'm here to talk about the server side automation that we use to do, um, to do our testing. So on the client side, we have MM test, and I talked about that before, and it's primarily responsible for having a consistent testing methodology that's adhered to every single time, and also catches things like handling variants properly and all of the rest of it. But the server side is also fairly time consuming. They, they have, they have, machines have to be deployed, set up, tests uploaded, executed, results collected and reported on, and this, it's much better to have developers on the team work on actual patches than working on test execution. So we have this collection and we call it under the heading of Marvin, which is named after a robot from a book that was responsible for mundane tasks. It used to be called Melbot as a joke because a, a housemate claimed that I hadn't done work in years because I'd written Melbot and it did all of my work. And so Melbot was originally written to do a substantial percentage of my work. But when other people started merging patches to it, I found that slightly uncomfortable, so I got renamed to Marvin. Uh, so it does numerous things, it monitors source trees, it deploys machines, configures them, it provides numerous helper tools in relation to it. It can do automated bisections, uh, it has the ability to do contiguous integration, even though we don't have it set up like that at the moment. And it can be used for, for executing ad hoc tests when, you're, when somebody is evaluating a test series. Um, it does have support for Git triggers, which is a relatively new feature, which I think is quite nice. And while the code is GPL, it is internal uh, repository only. Uh, while there is nothing preventing it being published, I never really got around to it. So the source monitoring is done by the tool Bob the Builder, named after a cartoon character. It can monitor either the kernel source tree, which is the, the, the Git tree that we base Lee upon, and OpenSUSE for that matter. And it can also monitor the mainline um, Git repository. And basically what it does is it looks for new tags as according as they're created. And from the SLE side of it sees a new SLE tag, and that is a distribution we currently care about. It will build the RPMs and add them to a queue. And then it will inform all of the machines that are in the test grid that, they're, that it should reread its queue and get, uh, and get started on it. So once it's built, it adds to queue, and then it creates an expanded tree uh, in another Git repository. The point is that at some point, if there's a problem there, we want to bisect it. And at the time we bisect it, we want to have the tree readily available to go. And not, because it takes about 20 minutes to create a, an expanded Git tree. And that's, that's wasted 20 minutes. So it's nice to have that sitting there and ready for us if we ever need it. Uh, tests are then prioritized based on the SLEE family. So SLEE is tested before OpenSUSE. And then tests are done in different collections, and the collections are ordered. So we have high priority collections, and we have low priority collections, which we'll talk about in a second. So Marvin itself is the primary loop that does, uh, that, that when it has nothing else to do, just runs tests. And it ha its collections would be QA priority. So there, there is a QA performance team, and they are responsible for actively monitoring performance and reporting bugs to us. We're more passively monitors. We, have test results and every so often check them. So it, it's, QA is primarily responsible for identifying and reporting these. But we have a test collection called QA Priority, which closely matches the tests they run, but not identical. The point being that if they report a bug, we can see if there's a correlation with a similar workload uh, from our own grid. Then there is security ones, which are tests done with in, uh, the mitigations enabled. Uh, there is VM oriented ones, scheduler, network, pairs of servers, like for network-oriented tests. There's a whole stack of them. Uh, the proprietary ones are nearly all SAP workloads. One exception. Um, 
they're not published externally for a variety of reasons, but they, they are included and they're kind of like happen in the middle. Uh, they could have been put at a higher priority, but regressions in the proprietary ones tend to be fairly complex. And the tests that happen before them will sometimes pinpoint which subsystem is actually at fault. Um, goes through the queue, it uses ORTIS to deploy machines. If it's a KVM based test, there's also KVM deploy, which is a helper script that comes with uh, Marvel, which is quite nice. If you run it, it will create a KVM instance that is almost identical to the host. So we can like do KVM and bare metal comparisons and so on. Um, stores the logs and a kernel can take up to three weeks to, to complete a test. So then, after that, we actually want to see what it is. So we have Johnny Bravo, which was a vain computer car or cartoon character. So it generates HTML reports that are detailed, the primary metrics, any variances that were identified. If the test is highly variable, it reports quartiles rather than means and standard deviation and so on. But all of this will be included in the report. We monitor the system as well as these tests are executing. We graph all of those to see in the event of regression, is there some hints just from like VM stat or IO stat or NUMA balancing stuff or whatever? All of this stuff is like monitors as the test, as test is run, and the graphs give us some indication of what's happening. Uh, all this stuff is, is, is configurable, and we do comparisons then between different SLE releases or between SLE and OpenSUSE or between a SLE kernel and a mainline kernel. Um, then there's the manual stuff. Because we are a developer team, eventually we want a series that can be evaluated ourselves. If we create a patch and upload it into a directory, we can use a helper script called manual run. And what it does is it will take a baseline kernel and the test kernel and will execute a configured set of tests against it. When it is completed, it will send us an email and there will be a dashboard showing like all of the tests that were run, whether there was performance gains or regressions, and on a per machine basis. So th this is kind of, th th this is primarily really handy when you want to test multiple machines and when the tests are long lived, because it's something you can do at the end of the day, execute this script and hopefully you'll have an email in the morning when you come back into work. Uh, when the manual test actually takes place varies. If it's currently doing another test, it'll wait till it's finished and then it will do your manual test. That said, if it's a high priority, everyone knows how to just cancel the machine's loop and restart it and it will pick up the manual test at the very beginning. So you, 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 can, you can manually reprioritize stuff if the test is really urgent to you. Then we have Sentinel. Um, the volume of tests is quite high and sometimes if too much time passes then it becomes multiple root causes of bugs. So we have Sentinel. Once a month it will do a long-lived set of tests against uh, a SLE family or against a mainline kernel. And if it finds any regression, it will generate a report and email it to the team. It's up to the team then to figure out if they need to take action or not. If it sees that the regression is large and it's a statistically significant regression, it will automatically queue a bisection. The bisections tend to be unreliable, but if the machine is doing nothing else, it might as well at least attempt it. And if it identifies the problem commit, great. And if it doesn't, we're no worse off. It still saves brain, it, it, it saves the, the developers to actually focus on the problem and not spend their time managing machines, or at least that's the intent behind it. There's also short-lived tests, and they take place every couple of days. They, they don't only take a few hours to run. Um, there can be some false positives in here because, uh, because of variance, but it did, there has been some talk with the Intel people who do have something similar called the zero day robot. Uh, it runs a very different set of tests that are much shorter lived. Um, we took a different approach because why duplicate their work and we run longer lived ones instead. But we were wonder, did wonder why their tests were so reliable or apparently so reliable and it comes down to numbers. They have a much larger number of sets of machines and they just throw hardware at the problem. And basically instead, it, 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 they might see that there was one machine that shows a bug, but they won't report it. When they see it appear on several, like 10 or 15 separate machines, then they think that it's likely actually significant. So it's, it's a numbers game. Uh, so that, that's Sentinel. Then there's the automatic bisection. Uh, Bisecting a performance regression is actually quite tricky, again, because of the variance issue. So there's a couple of different methodologies that it will use to try and detect a regression. And the three of them are sigma, midway, and worst. 
So Sigma will try and see what the smallest statistically significant regression was at the time that it was introduced. So this can be good or bad because if, if it finds the first root cause uh, of what might have caused the problem. But if you're actually looking for a very large regression, that might miss it. So that's where midway comes in. It takes, the, it takes that point that's halfway between the good and bad. And then it tries to find when that happened. So sometimes this will find the worst problem, but not necessarily the only problem. So it, it requires a bit of judgment on the behalf of the developer, or else they'll have to manually do parts of the bisection themselves to find out where the real problem is. Or analyze it from first principles. Bisection gets you places, but it doesn't get you everywhere. There are a large number of problems that just require a developer to sit down and analyze it from first principles. On the other hand, that takes a person's time. So we nearly always start with a bisection because it might work. Then we have the git hooks. The git hooks are kind of like the manual, uh, the, the, the manual run thing. It basically means if I'm developing something in my tree and I push it to the git repository on Marvin's primary server, it will automatically generate the patches, upload them, uh, queue up the test, and email me what's done. So there's an example here which was testing a revert. And so I pushed onto the, the, the first part is showing just a where the repository is. The series was a revert that, that I just called a revert v1 or one. It's just a naming convention I tend to use myself. And then it was users in Gorm because it's me. Sockperf because that's the name of the configuration. So there's a configuration file called config list in Gorman Sockperf. And it specifies um, that it's going to be running Sockperf, what distribu uh, the distribution config that it's going to use, and a few other bits and pieces. The config file can have a lot of stuff in it. It can do hooks that will run before and after tests if necessary. So if you wanted to do a comparison that was based on like tuning parameters, you can set that up all in the config file. So you, you can pretty much arbitrarily define any test at all in it. Uh, but in this case, it's just running Sockperf. Nothing's too special. For whatever reason, I was running it on OpenSUSE Leap 15.0. And I wanted it to run on the machine called Anderson, and I wanted to compare a vanilla kernel with revert v1 or 1, and it emailed me when it was done. So the future for stuff like this, like th it, it's not the team's job to work on this. It's intended to act as a force multiplier, because developer time is valuable, and there's no point spending time configuring, setting up machines, and wasting it. You're meant to defer all of that work onto this. And there's no, while it is somewhat orientated around performance, it doesn't have to be performance. The intersection between when machine management is done and when MM tests get called is a single line. So if you wanted to have some other arbitrary set of tests done, or it, it could be wired into it fairly easily, because that would be your point of interface. You could reuse all of the other things, like the, the deployment management, queue management, the automatic bisection, things like that. Um, what I would like to see for something like this, though, and, uh, and where at least I'll be going with it for myself personally, is that I will use the Git hooks in the future to stage anything that I'm going to merge to Slee, say. So if I'm running something and I'm not sure it's going to be actually a win, I'll push it onto the hook, and when I get the email notification, then I'll know it's actually safe to actually push that branch. I wouldn't necessarily wire something like this into the kernel source uh, functional testing because of the length of time that it takes, but it's, it's actually relatively rare we see patches from other teams that cause performance regressions. There's maybe like one or two per release. If there's actually a regression, it's usually one of us that has introduced it because we always face this problem where you fix one performance problem, but you cause two more. Uh, it's some, and sometimes it's a trade-off, like as Mike Galbert put it, it's a Rob Peter to pay Paul situation. And you have to decide which one do you want more. So what I would like to do at some point is actually stage any major series that's coming from the performance team through this before we actually push the kernel source to avoid that. Because then we can run it on a variety of machines and the, the, the risk of introducing regressions is lowered. So uh, that's it. I think, like I can show you, this is what the grid is currently doing, and you can barely see that. That's awesome. Uh, the top part of it is, just sh is showing the list of the machines. I think there is like four, it's about 14 machines that are uh, running 24-7, collecting stuff for us. Uh, they're running a variety of different stuff. Uh, two of them, uh, one of them is on Sleep 12 SP3, uh, one, two, three, four, five are currently doing a Sentinel test. So they're like doing a, a, a periodic check. They're testing both, they're on SLEE 15 at the moment. One is SLEE 12 SP4 is the second. They're busy. 
Uh, one of them is nearly done. It's running the test collection called Dubious. Dubious has almost never found a perf performance regression, but we run it anyway. Um, yeah, the, the, the grid just kind of keeps doing. So one thing that was interesting on it is at the very bottom, you can't really see it, but SLEE 12 SP4 has been queued. So at 11 this morning, the tag was created, or roughly 11 this morning. Bob came along, saw it, queued it up. Uh, it's already in the queue. And at the very bottom, there is a number of machines that are waiting to reread it. The second that they reach the end of what they're doing now, they will start SLEE 12 SP4 testing. So I would have a full expectation that by the time I get back to Ireland on Friday, they'll have the first set of tests from SLEE 12 SP4 and it didn't have to lift a finger. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, this is an example of a bisection report. It's also impossible to see. The top part shows the configuration of it. So it was NAS, OMP. Uh, so it's a NASA parallel benchmark. It has been parallelized with OpenMP, and it was the subkernel SP, which is just a part of the benchmark suite. And it identified a NUMA balancing related patch that had been pushed upstream as being the problem. It found it in OpenSUSE Leap 15.0. And if I scroll down, again, you find it very hard to see, but I could email it if you were interested. It shows the initial good and initial bad results and the performance delta between them. So it says it was a 52.68% regression. And then it shows the last good, the penultimate good commit, and the first bad. Because sometimes, particularly when it's a performance one, they can be, you can get near an area. And by looking at the last good and the second to last good, sometimes you can get a better idea on what the real commit might be. Particularly if the, if the first bad commit is a merge branch or something completely ridiculous. You can look at what happens nearest to see, was it just close? Uh, and rerun it if necessary. And then this is an example of a dashboard, which is almost impossible to see as well because of the size of it. But each column is a machine, and if it's green, it means there's a gain, and if there's a red, it means there's a loss. This is currently comparing SLEE 12 SP3 and SLEE 12 SP4. And it's mostly green. There's a few reds, but this is also a release going. I know some of these have been closed since. But you can get a hint for very early on if you're doing oak, if we're doing really well or really badly. When we started Sleep 15, for example, this thing was pure red. It was very disheartening. Sleep 15 was not fun to get into working order. But as according as time went by, it became increasingly green until um, we reached GA. So that was kind of sweet. And this is a comparison between Sleep 15 and the latest mainline kernel. The view being, we always should be faster than mainline. Like the, the, we, we've that stabilized the kernel and done a good job, and we should always be faster. And so all of these, it this looks, looks like there seems to be a lot of red there. The lot of red is because it's saying that mainline is much slower. Um, now, while there is exceptions to that, sometimes they're very close. It's kind of saying for Bonnie, for, on one machine, like it's roughly 4% of a difference, but only on that machine. So, so you kind of have to take the good with the bad. But it's nice to be able to not have to manually do this. It's just every so often you go, you pick one of them, figure out what's actually gone wrong, write the patches necessary for it upstream, and then get a queued back on the grid and see how things progress over time. So that is our server-side automation. Is there any questions? What language is it written? I knew you were going to say this. <laughs> I'm asking. <laughs> uh, depends what mood I'm in <laughs> at the time. Uh, w one downside is this, is there is a large amount of technical debt in there because it was, uh, in all cases, it, we're, we're not in the business of writing automation. The point was to not have to manually run tests. The vast bulk of Marvin is written in Bash. Uh, some of it is written in Perl. None of us is written in Python. <laughs> in R, yes. Some of it is in R, particularly the statistic analysis stuff. Some of it is written in R. Who actually monitors the results of the various test runs? Sentinel. Sentinel is one of the primary things that actually monitors the results. Um, but we have to manually look at it ourselves as well. So every so often, uh, particularly in the early basis, uh, our, the role for each member of the team would be to look at the dashboard and go to where their primary area of responsibility is, find any of the reds, and then sit down and figure it out. 
But so Sentinel does does periodic watching, but it's the responsibility of each team member to look at that dashboard as well. And when they find major regressions, they're meant to they're meant to go and fix them. My my point was so there are people that are like as a human monitoring this output. Yes. Or are there any email notification going out to teams? And like, is there also um, product QA involved in this, or is this entirely only monitored by labs ourselves? This is only really monitored by my by my own team. Um, Sentinel, when it finds something, will send an email to the it will send an email to the team, but it will take no other action. And it will send two types of emails. If it finds a regression, it'll send that. But if it finds a performance gain, particularly in mainline, it will also send that. The view being that if something is very obviously good in mainline, it's a backport candidate. It will also do, uh, it won't automatically bisect the gain. But included in the email is the command needed to queue an automatic bisection to find that. So if I see a major gain, the command will be underneath it. I'll cut and paste it. When the bisection is done, it'll email me and hopefully identify which commit the backport. And then the, obviously the backport has to be done by a person. But the, the, uh, primarily we must respond to bugs from QA performance. But if we don't have any open bug, go to the dashboard, pick a workload, fix it. Do that in a loop until everything's great. Any other questions? Uh, uh, one question about uh, BISAC. About? Uh, uh, about BISAC. Yes. Uh, uh, did you uh, store the the uh, the H1 by sec. Yeah. Uh, Full logs are preserved. So so it means when we repeat the by sec, maybe maybe when when the git step the same commit, you don't need build, install, reboot. At each stage, it builds, installs, and reboots. It has to. Uh, um, so I mean, maybe we <laughs> we could uh, optimize this. Because uh, sometimes we, we, we step the same one commit, but we still build, install, reboot, and run. Because some, some, some performance uh, testing uh, takes too long time. So okay. if we store some result, we could compare directly. So you, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. You, you, if, you, if you know the window is narrow, you can just like bisect a smaller window. Oh. Um, it's... Mm. Yeah, but sometimes maybe the same, the, it's a different uh, issue, but 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 have same result maybe. There are sometimes a case where a, a regression will be identified in multiple workloads that bisect the same commit. That does happen. Uh, okay, copy that. I know. Uh, maybe, sure. maybe we could uh, manually choose different window to... You can manually choose a different window if you choose. Uh, because it, it is just a command line thing and there's the dash dash good parameter and the dash dash bad. If you know there's a narrow window, well then just use use a better known good and bad commit. Okay, okay got it. Um, one thing that can be odd is like sometimes uh, there is... A, a commit can be both good and bad. That's a kind of a tricky one. The tool can be configured to run each bisection point multiple times. Just in, in case it's something that intermittently occurs. Uh, it, it's rare that we need it, but it is possible. Any other questions? Okay. I have two questions. The first one is uh, you just mentioned when manual tests have to do the manual test and uh, you have to make it cut in the um, automation test testing queue, right? Mm -hmm. So after the manual test, how, I mean, how the automation can keep continue? Do you need a manual check no. trigger at all? When when the when when the manual test is complete, it will just go back to the primary queue, and it'll just take the next element off the queue, unless there's sentinel work to do. So the order checks thing is says, do I have manual work to do? Do I have sentinel work to do? Do, uh, do I go back to the main queue? So when the manual test completes, it just moves on to the next thing in the queue, redeploys the machine, carries on. It doesn't stop. Okay. So it's, it's, it's actually really rare for a machine to stop. It, 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 the, 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 the infrastructure supports reserving machines and orthos and releasing them if they're idle. 
since the grid activates, it has never released the machine. My second question is, you also mentioned when, um, when the automation recognized a serious uh, decline, then mm -hmm. the, the test will be auto automated by do the bisection, right? Mm -hmm. So um, how, can you give some example uh, how, how much serious you will think that the test will need to do the bisection? Because for different benchmark or they has totally different uh, KPI. Currently it is configured to run an automatic bisection if the performance delta is more than two by the variance or the standard deviation. So if the difference between the two of them is, is two standard deviations in difference, it will say that there is a high probability that this is a real regression and it will queue on that basis. However, if the delta is very small in absolute terms, it'll decide not to. So like it might say, yes, this is significantly significant, but it's differing by 0.01. It might still say, okay, yes, it's statistically significant, but that's probably not going to bisect safely. So it applies a couple of rules, but the first one it says, is the difference high enough that it's outside the noise? And if it's outside the noise, then it will queue it. But if it decides to queue something, it says bisection, yes, auto queued. And if, it's, if it decides not to bisect, bisect, the report says no, and it includes the reason why it decided not to. So like, it basically has like a couple of rules that it applies that have worked out well in the past. All right, thank you for, oh, uh, okay, one more. I think this, is, this will have to be the last one, I think, as I ran over. Are all four architectures covered? We have only implemented support for x86 and ARM. Power support used to exist, but we don't have a machine that's reliable enough that could do remote deployments. Um, it, so, so power support was dro uh, dropped. But it would take about half an hour to reactivate power support, but uh, the, of that machine, one of them is AR64, Overdrive 4. And you, because you said, is, our, is ARM support, is that your real question? <laughs> no, no I, I knew of the two, and I was curious about, in particular, whether you may have resource needs, like, for Z or power. <laughs> if, if, if they were made available, I could hook them up. Systems, uh, the, the, the biggest thing that I would be looking for, though, is that remote deployment works. Uh, remote deployment is awkward on ARM, because the auto yast files don't exist. And I don't have the time or the, the, the nest, I haven't spent the necessary time to write the OCS files that it needs. So when, when the ARM machine needs to change distribution, it emails me and tells me, please deploy me. And then when I've deployed it, then I push enter and it continues. Uh, the same would probably happen for Power or S390. So there'd be a bit more manual overhead for that unless we fully got the deployment automated. But actually supporting multiple arches is relatively trivial. Thank you.